I received uh, doom to uh, review uh, about uh, a few months ago, and I wrote a review in the new Criterion and got engulfed in this argument, which uh, Neil Ferguson, the great historian from Hoover and Oxford and a real academic pantheon of I think he now lives in Montana, right? Uh, you want me to come up to him? Yeah, come on, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, and uh, not just to be with you. And and we disagree, but but it's a great book, and I and it's just full of fascinating hist historical details, and it's so uh, deeply written and s with such detail and authority that you can make the case against his vision that somehow globalization is leading us to doom. But, but he may uh, be ready to uh, refine this view today, but we'll see. Uh, Neil Ferguson. Thank you, George. Thank you. George Gilder. Well, it's always uh, a delight to confront your critical reviewers. Uh, I don't get a enough opportunities to do this, actually. Uh, it should become a regular thing. Review Neil's book and then confront him on stage. Uh, has a kind of gladiatorial quality to it. I'm gonna talk about uh, the book and update it a bit. Uh, books aren't like newspapers. Uh, they take a while to get produced. So this book was finished and uh, at the printers more than a year ago. So in the presentation, I'll get a chance to do a bit of updating. And then George and I will have a very friendly uh, discussion. If you didn't read his review, uh, I can tell you that it, it uh, compares quite favorably with some of my more vituperative hater critics, because it agrees with some parts of the book, but disagrees with others. And in my world, that's a victory, actually. So I'm going to talk about uh, the politics of catastrophe and try to set the pandemic uh, that we are emerging from in historical perspective. That's really the point of the book. Because most of us, when it became clear that we were entering a pandemic, didn't really have an awful lot to compare it with, or at least that was how it felt. And that was why you got wildly varying reactions in early 2020. Uh, some people talked as if the Black Death was coming, or at least the 1918-19 influenza, and others talked as if it was just seasonal flu and we were all exaggerating. So let's try and put this thing in some kind of perspective. It's not even clear how many people have died prematurely of COVID. You can go and see a number above 5 million on the Johns Hopkins website, uh, but actually uh, IHME thinks and I guess that's a local outfit round here, that you're looking at more like 12 million uh, premature deaths, uh, deaths attributable to COVID, they say. And The Economist magazine uh, says that the death toll could be as high as 19.8 million. So there's not even a consensus about how many people have died uh, prematurely uh, because of COVID. Uh, the US death toll is somewhere uh, uh, in the region of three quarters of a, a million at its peak, according to the uh, Johns Hopkins and other uh, sources, something like 3,500 Americans were dying a day. There's still a significant number of people whose deaths are being attributed to COVID now. Uh, but it seems clear that the worst of the pandemic is uh, behind us now, unless some new variant comes along that is vaccine evading. And if you talk to the epidemiologists and the people who make vaccines, the probability of that, what I call the omega variant, is, is relatively low. Like all respiratory pandemics, this one came in waves, and that was predictable if you were an historian. Uh, and also, uh, it varied enormously in timing and scale from place to place. 
You'll remember that last year, the epidemiologists liked to say, we have to flatten the curve, as if there was just going to be one curve. And I kept going around saying, you don't understand. With pandemics like this, you get multiple waves, and the first is not necessarily the biggest. So you can see from these recent uh, charts that there really was enormous variation in timing, not only between countries, but between states uh, of the United States. And it would be a brave uh, person who, who said it's over at this point. Uh, in fact, I think it would, be, it would be wrong to say that. It would be more accurate to say that we're in the transition from pandemic to endemic. That is to say, it's unlikely that there'll be another wave of significant excess mortality in the United States, but it's not as if COVID is going away. Uh, I said earlier today to somebody, you, you can tell the pandemic's over because more and more people you know are getting COVID. And it's no longer a big deal because if they're vaccinated, it doesn't actually make them terribly ill by and large. Excess mortality is the meaningful measure that we should focus on because that captures all the deviation from, let's say, a five-year or 10-year uh, average that, that is going on in a pandemic. And that means that people who, who died for reasons that were not directly attributable to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but whose deaths were hastened by the conditions of the pandemic, people who couldn't get to hospital to see the doctor about the heart condition or couldn't get their cancer treated early enough, these excess deaths are also captured in the excess mortality data. And I think this is the best way of seeing the extent to which uh, the pandemic uh, is at least uh, coming to an end, even if it's not strictly too true to say that it's over. If you just look at the countries here from the Financial Times chart, I'm not sure how clear that is, as the print is rather small, uh, you can see that excess mortality is uh, over in a great many of the countries and, and lies quite some way uh, in the past, but in others it's not. In other words, there's still a significant uh, gap between expected and actual mortality uh, in, for example, Colombia. But my job as an historian is not really to get into the weeds of uh, excess mortality statistics in the countries for which we have them. It's to try and put this in some kind of perspective. When you compare it with the great pandemics of the past, COVID is not a really big pandemic. It's nothing close to the Black Death or the Plague of Justinian, which we think may have killed as many as a, a third of humanity. Uh, we're really talking here at this point of, of a death toll of 0.066% of the world's population. If you buy the economist's highest estimate, it's 0.26%. That's a trivial number by comparison with the Black Death. It's an order of magnitude smaller than the death toll of the 1980-19 Spanish influenza. In fact, it was only this year that COVID-19 overtook the 1957-58 Asian flu in terms of its uh, mortality relative to global population. And most people uh, had never heard of the 1957-58 influenza uh, pandemic because it, it was largely forgotten even by the people who lived through it and doesn't figure as a major event in our historical memory. We think of Sputnik, we, we don't think of the Asian flu, uh, even although it really was a pretty significant pandemic. The thing that this current pandemic is closest to is something that happened in 1889-90, which might possibly have been a coronavirus pandemic, though contemporaries called it the Russian flu. I'm almost certain none of you had ever heard of that pandemic until I told you about it now because it's not a major historical event. It's not the kind of thing that makes it into the history books. So that helps us sense that this was not a really big pandemic by historical standards. It was up there with the 1889-90 Russian flu. Another way of sizing this is just to look at a country that has lots of long-run data that are quite reliable, the country I come from, Britain. And you can do some nice numbers that go all the way back to the mid-19th century for uh, mortality rates, age-adjusted mortality rates, and just relate them to a 10-year average to get a sense of the outlying years. And if you do that, 2020 
looks a little like a few other years in British history, 1918, 1940, uh, and 1951. Now, you kind of know what happened in 1918, because I already told you it was the end of World War I plus the Spanish flu. I don't really need to tell you what happened in 1940. We had a little disagreement with the Germans, which was rather costly uh, in terms of, of life. But what happened in 1951? I mean, 1951, in terms of excess mortality, was as bad a year in Britain as 2020. And I, I could ask the same question of an English audience and nobody would know. At the time, the Daily Mail, that always reliable source, <laughs> described 1951 as the worst winter for illness, the worst in history. Uh, doctors emphasize that this is the worst winter for illness ever known. Trust the Daily Mail to go with the hyperbole. Of course, that can't be right because clearly the worst winters in English history must have been during the Black Death of the 1340s. But I find it remarkable that, that a year characterized by excess mortality as severe as we saw in Britain last year has almost entirely been forgotten. And you will not find this event in history books. Oddly enough, we've all lived through a worse pandemic than COVID. And that was the HIV AIDS pandemic. And the reason it's worse, it's killed to date 36 million people, is that we never found a vaccine for it. We still haven't been able to figure that out, though we did come up with treatments that prevent uh, the virus uh, creating deadly AIDS. So we've lived through a worse pandemic in terms of the total death toll than COVID in our lifetimes. Why then did this one feel so different? Why has it been so uh, problematic and for many people traumatic? As I said, the big difference between SARS-CoV-2 and HIV is that we have a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. The reason 5758 stopped was that even more rapidly, American scientists uh, came up with a vaccine against the Asian flu. We talk about what happened last year as if it was record-breaking, but really, uh, there was a, an even more rapid vaccine turnaround in 57 when the great Montanan vaccinologist, Morris Hillman, uh, in a spectacular race, found a vaccine uh, and was able to get it into people's arms within just a few months uh, of identifying the new strain of flu. What's interesting is in 1957, there was very little vaccine hesitancy in this country. Vaccination was not a politicized issue. People were very eager, in fact, fought to get to the front of the line for the vaccine, just as they were eager to get their kids vaccinated against polio, which at the time was a cause of much greater public anxiety uh, than influenza. What is really interesting about this disaster uh, is actually not the public health statistics. It's not the death toll that makes COVID-19 a historically significant event. By that measure, it's not a remarkable disaster. What makes it a remarkable disaster is the economic and the social and the political fallout. Let me start with the economics. I'll keep this brief because I want to get into my argument with the rogue reviewer. <laughs> so I'm going to rattle through this so that we can settle this, George. Man to man. What is really significant about what happened last year is economic, firstly. Uh, in relation to public health, not one of history's big disasters. In relation to public finance, a disaster comparable in magnitude to World War II. That is the fascinating thing that most commentators miss about what happened. Uh, when David Cutler and Larry Summers tried to ballpark last year what the total cost would be to the US economy, they arrived at an estimate of 90% of GDP. That is a huge hit, far, far larger than the contraction in economic activity that the BEA measured, which was something like 3.5%. If all you knew about the United States of America was the debt to GDP ratio, 
and the size of the Fed balance sheet, if that was all you knew, you would assume that World War III had broken out, perhaps in 2008 or 2009, and was still raging with no end in sight. Because only in World War II has the US federal debt in public hands relative to gross domestic product rocketed as steeply as it did in the years after the global financial crisis, and particularly in the year 2020 and the year 2021. Uh, the black line in this chart here is the realized debt to GDP uh, series. The colored lines are the attempts at various junctures of the Congressional Budget Office to guess where it will go. And you will notice that these estimates, these projections have not been terribly accurate over time. Uh, currently, and let's hope they're wrong again, uh, they project rather alarmingly that it will double again between now and 2050 and take us up above 200% of GDP. But all you need to know for now is that the impact of COVID-19 has had a comparable effect on public finance in the United States as World War II and taken the debt to GDP ratio to roughly where it was in 1945-46. I could make the same kind of argument about the Fed balance sheet. It's essentially a similar story, where only in time of world war did we see such huge expansions of central bank balance sheets as we've seen in our time, first in the financial crisis and then in the pandemic. Why? How do we explain this? Remember what I'm telling you. The public health impact is not on a world historical scale. It's not a pandemic as big as 1918, 19, nowhere close. But the economic impact looks like a world war. So what happened was that we had an option that didn't exist in 1957 or in 1918. And that option was to lock everybody up in their homes, to place large parts of the population under house arrest in the name of preventing the spread of the virus. The reason this did not happen in 1957, although it was a comparably contagious virus, and unlike SARS-CoV-2, the Asian flu killed kids. And it killed kids at a very significant rate. The excess mortality amongst teenagers in 57 was really quite marked, unlike in, in our pandemic. But there was no option in 1957 to lock everybody up until a vaccine was ready. Because hardly anybody in 1957 could work from home. The option wasn't even considered by the Eisenhower administration. They understood that they could not stop the spread of the virus. All they should do was focus on finding a vaccine and otherwise keep things going as normally as possible. Schools weren't closed, despite, as I said, a meaningful risk uh, of sickness and even death to young people. Now, there's a debate which George and I may have in a minute about whether the lockdowns were necessary, whether there was an alternative. And I think this is a complex debate because it's not as simple as it was often made to seem in the media, as if we had a choice between locking everybody up or letting it rip and getting to herd immunity naturally. We know it wasn't that simple, because if you look at mobility data, and that's what these Google data allow you to do, even in parts of the United States where there were not shelter-in-place orders and where restrictions were pretty light, I spent most of uh, the pandemic in Montana, which was certainly run very differently from California, even in those states that had pretty light touch restrictions, mobility went down extremely steeply, particularly in the first phase in the spring of 2020, and it remained well below normal levels right the way up uh, uh, until this year. And in some cases, it is still, if you just look at transit station mobility or workplace mobility, it is still significantly depressed relative to normality. So there wasn't really a simple choice between lockdowns and let it rip. In truth, even if there had been no lockdowns, a lot of mobility reduction would have happened spontaneously. And this was predicted by my colleague at Hoover, John Cochran, who suggested that there would be adaptive behavior as people assessed the risk and took their own decisions about whether to go out 
uh, and whether to socialize, even in the absence of, of the kind of orders that were imposed on the coastal states. Doom is a history of all disasters. I've focused on our disaster to try to provide some perspective. But the book is mostly about every disaster you ever heard of, uh, including some of the really famous ones that didn't kill a ton of people, but still made an impact. And my book tells you exactly what it was that caused the Titanic to sink with such colossal loss of life in 1912. I'm not going to tell you now why that happened. I want to incentivize you to read the book. All I'm going to tell you is that the movie is not correct. Disasters, including the Titanic and the Hindenburg disaster, have a, have a human element, always. And one of the key arguments of the book is that we can't really draw a distinction between natural and man-made disasters, even though we do it instinctively. Was COVID-19 a natural disaster? Even if you don't believe the virus was engineered, I don't think it was engineered, it's pretty clear that it was a man-made disaster in the sense that wherever the virus came from, the Chinese Communist Party did lamentably little to contain its spread through December and most of January because they behaved rather as their Soviet counterparts did when Chernobyl happened. They sought to cover up the disaster until they were forced to admit that it was happening. Unlike Chernobyl, however, this disaster killed more than 5 million people around the world. So I want to talk about the human element, which I think is common to all disasters. Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate, famously said that famines should not be thought of as natural disasters. And it hit me as I was writing this book that that might be true of all disasters. Famines that we, we should not think of famines, particularly the great famines of the last 200 years, as, as results of natural phenomena, crop failure, bad weather. That in truth, famines were, Sen argued, the results either of uh, market mismanagement or more commonly, governmental blundering. Or, one should add, deliberate government malice in the case of Stalin or, or Mao. But I want to argue that, that really this distinction applies generally. Even a volcanic eruption is in a sense a man-made disaster if you have built a bloody great city at the foot of the volcano and then rebuild it after the eruption, which is of course something that happens in many parts of the world. A critical and controversial part of the book was the argument that it was much too easy last year to lay the blame for the political mistakes that led to excess mortality on a few populist leaders. And I won't waste time by naming them. I argue in the book that it's a common failure of analysis to lay the blame on the person at the top. When the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up shortly after launch, an event that many of you will remember, seeing it on, on television was one of those searing moments. There was an initial attempt by the Washington Post and the usual suspects to blame it on Ronald Reagan, because that's what the press does. They tried to argue that the, the shuttle launch had been rushed so that Reagan could mention it in a speech. But a great uh, scientist, Richard Feynman, showed that that wasn't remotely true. That in reality, the engineers at NASA had always known that there was a one in a hundred chance that the thing would blow up because of leaks uh, from the fuel tanks. They also knew that it was more likely to blow up on a cold day than on a hot day because the legendary O-rings would shrink in cold weather and make the fuel leak more likely. Why was that one in a hundred probability not more widely known? Because the NASA bureaucrats concealed from the people funding the program that that was what the engineers thought. The NASA bureaucrats, including the enigmatic Mr. Kingsbury, turned it into a one in a hundred thousand chance that the thing would blow up, which is really rather a different risk. I want to argue, as I did in the book, that we had our own Mr. Kingsbury. Uh, 
that the real cause of the excess mortality in the United States last year was a terrible failure by the public health bureaucracy, who had a pandemic preparedness plan, 36 pages long, I've read it, that looked good on paper. The US was rated as the number one country in the world for pandemic preparedness in 2019. But the people who were responsible for the plan, including Robert Cadleck, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness, who had this one job, knew that the plan was worthless. If we don't build this, he said, shortly after the publication of the plan, meaning a real insurance policy against a pandemic, we're going to be SOL should we ever be confronted with it. We're whistling in the dark a little bit. Well, I didn't know what SOL stood for. <laughs> Being a simple Scotsman, I had to look it up. So the guy whose one job this was, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness, knew we'd be SOL if there was a pandemic. That's the Mr. Kingsbury factor that we're gradually coming to realize pervaded the public health bureaucracy. What was the right way to deal with COVID? That's not difficult. It's what they did in South Korea and Taiwan. You ramped up testing as fast as you could. If necessary, you used contact tracing to identify infected people. And if they were infected or you thought they were, you quarantined them. That's why only 12 people died of COVID in Taiwan in 2020, despite the fact that Taiwan is right next to the epicenter, mainland China. We completely failed to do any of that completely failed. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control successfully prevented any other agencies, public or private, from producing tests and then produced a test kit of their own that didn't work. Scott Gottlieb has much more on this in his book. Let me draw this uh, to a conclusion so that we can get on with the discussion. I said that the historical significance of a disaster lay beyond, often beyond, the death toll. Some disasters have really small death tolls, but kind of everybody remembers them. Seven people died when the Challenger blew up. But everyone kind of remembers it. Whereas nobody remembers 1957-58. The other thing that's significant beyond the economics is the politics. Often in times of plague or other kinds of disaster, you get great waves of protest sometimes of a religious character, sometimes of a secular political character, and 2020 was no exception. Uh, the great protest wave unleashed by the killing of George Floyd was a truly extraordinary event in American history. But to my eyes, as an historian, it recalled the great flagellant orders uh, of the 1340s. This was a great act of expiation. Let me leave, because George is eager to get on the stage leave you with one final observation. Although we had a tremendous wave of protest, which has had a hangover of increased homicide in many American cities that persists to this day, in truth, as often is the case, in the wake of a disaster or even during it, most people crave normalcy, not revolution. And just as in 1920, uh, Americans voted for the normalcy candidate, Warren Harding, in just the same way in 2020, they voted for the normalcy candidate, Joe Biden. The big question which we're now going to discuss, George, is whether Americans are going to get normalcy. Indeed, are they getting normalcy now? Because it seems to me fairly clear, and this is a pattern throughout history, that you may vote for normalcy, but in the wake of a disaster like COVID-19, normalcy may take a little longer to return, if it ever does, than you expect. I'll leave it there and invite my reviewer on stage. Thank you. As I said earlier, there are no hard feelings when a review says a few good things, because you can just take the good things and put them on the back of the paperback. <laughs> exactly. This was not a this was not a negative review, and I should, I should say it was a thoughtful and intelligent uh, review. One of those rare reviews which suggests that the reviewer has actually read the whole book. <laughs> Very rare thing. Well, one of the themes of the, of the book 
was that uh, doom was becoming more likely because of the advance of technology, because of the um, uh, progress of globalization, expansion of international trade. Modernity somehow conduces to uh, doom or to catastrophe. And, and I believe that the, the really is no evidence for this, that uh, uh, during the period of modernity, uh, world population rose from uh, 300 million to now nearly 8 billion. Uh, act, lifespans rose from the 30s to the 70s, and uh, in advanced countries, close to 80. And, and so, uh, the fundamental theme of the book, which is what I uh, derided in, the, in my review, uh, based on uh, information that you indeed provided in later chapters, uh, led me to, th to think that uh, your thesis was wrong. Have you reconsidered your thesis, or do you, <laughs> or do you still believe that this that we should? us technologists here should abandon our cause and uh, lock down and retreat and, uh, and uh, return to some separate a world of separate decoupled nations with less trade and, uh, and uh, more primitive but natural lifestyles. <laughs> Maybe in Montana, are you finding? Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I, I see that you, you did read the book, but, but just not my book. <laughs> because... Uh, I've read lots of books. and that, that's, that, that's, that's not, of course, what, what the book says at all, and I'll, I'll, now, um, I'll now do my best to uh, set you straight. The, Good. The, the book argues, first of all, that, that we, we greatly exaggerate the probability of doom. I mean, the central part of the early chapters is pointing out that we're fascinated by the idea of the end of the world. It's in all the great world religions. Uh, we love watching movies about it. And when a disaster strikes, it's the Daily Mail response. It's the end of the world. It's the worst ever. And in, in reality, uh, as I try to show, that that is actually not the problem that we have to fear. That the, At some point, presumably, uh, the species has some prospect of going extinct, the planet becomes uninhabitable, maybe Elon doesn't get the Mars colonies in time. <laughs> but it's all very, very long, long and far in the future. So first of all, it's important to, to notice that although the book's called Doom, I spend the first few chapters making fun of the idea of doom and showing that what we really have to fear are modest, uh, modestly sized disasters that can kill a relatively small percentage of us. Uh, and, and that's really what COVID illustrates. Now, the point that you're making is that, on balance, modernity broadly defined wins. Technology wins, uh, and the globalization of technology wins. Uh, the problem is that, in addition to the old ways in which we can have disaster, uh, the old ways including pandemics, but also uh, including the kind of great geological disasters that we've kind of forgotten about, because there hasn't been a really big volcanic eruption since 1815, not big enough to affect the world's climate. In addition to the old forms of disaster, which are, I think, integral to living on this planet, mm -hmm. uh, we have new forms that we couldn't previously do because technology has this double edge to it. The, the story of inexorable human progress that you just gave us is true, but so too is it the case that the two biggest wars in history happened between 1914 uh, and 1945. And one of the really big problems with a, 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 an optimistic view of history is that those events happened. Yeah. And they killed not the elderly prematurely, they killed millions of young men and young women because many of the deaths with civilians very prematurely and very horribly. So that, that's the, the first point I'll, I'll make. I'll make a couple more. The second point is that with atomic weapons, we created an even more powerful technology mm -hmm. 
uh, that has the capacity to kill a lot of people incredibly fast if, if it's used again yeah. on any scale. And we, we can't pretend that that isn't there. It's very clearly there. Uh, Jim Stavridis' new book about the US-China relationship, uh, 2034, Jim Stavridis, the former uh, admiral and supreme commander at Europe, has a novel in which he imagines a US-China war in which nuclear weapons get used. Yeah. Um, and finally, we need to recognize that, that there are new technologies that are coming into existence or being deployed more widely, including, of course, artificial intelligence, that have the potential to create an additional layer of risk. So I don't think we well, really disagree unless you want to misrepresent my book, which you did in your review and you just did it again there. But once you get a clear reading of the book, you'll see that we don't disagree that much. Yeah, we don't. But uh, maybe maybe I can uh, sharpen the disagreement a little. I, f I felt that uh, you were uh, somewhat gullible about accepting the idea that there was something doom-laden about COVID. Now, I, I in the last week, uh, the, in a t group of Italian uh, analysts have uh, scrutinized all their data from Italy and uh, produced a paper which showed that just 5% of Italian deaths actually were attributable uh, to COVID. With, they, there were three uh, that were with COVID tests, but uh, there were uh, only 5% could be said to really have been killed by COVID. And uh, this um, correlates very closely with the CDC's numbers, which show only 6% of uh, American deaths, supposedly from COVID, were unaccompanied by cancer, heart disease, TB, uh, real deadly conditions. And uh, this means that the number of deaths that really occurred was closer to 40,000 than 750,000. I mean, it was, it, it, it's just, uh, it's just a, a, a drastic and ridiculous exaggeration of the, of the event that was generated in part by um, PCR testing, which uh, magnifies a trillion fold the size of the molecule that you're, and, uh, and uh, the and it's governed by the uh, level of the threshold you use and uh, and uh, Carrie Mullis, who wrote a whole book about this uh, and died, on, who was won the Nobel laureate for with Nobel Prize for inventing PCR. Actually, um, uh, he died in August, just before COVID. But his book. Dancing Nude in the Minefield, or whatever it was called, uh, showed a previous fight he had with Fauci over uh, the AIDS numbers that you cite there. I mean, Carrie Mullis thinks that there was no African AIDS crisis, that uh, essentially that, uh, that this was uh, a function of PCR testing that could... Uh, identify any particular uh, malady in the biome and that uh, so so I believe that this 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 uh, that COVID really was a scandal and that the crucial uh, rather than an actual doom laden event and the crucial uh, uh, chart you showed up there was uh, showed all the other disasters and COVID almost imperceptible. And, and that the impact, it was even lower than that number because it uh, didn't, uh, wasn't age adjusted. And, uh, eight, and uh, the 57, 58 flu, as you informed us in your excellent book, I, I recommend everybody reads this book. I just, it, it just, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but. Uh, can I cut you off, George? Yes, you can cut me off. <laughs> so I think the problem with uh, those people who wanted very badly last year to play down COVID, uh, and you were one of them, 
I was. Is so. that uh, the excess mortality statistics just won't have it. And you don't need to know anything else. You've got to explain to me why excess mortality, why mortality was about 19% above normal over a year plus, nearly two years in the United States. And it was between 10 and 20% above normal in most, not all, but most European countries. And why in countries like Peru or Ecuador, it was vastly above normal. I mean, how else is one to explain this but by the advent of a novel pathogen highly deadly to elderly people with pre-existing conditions. Now, I show in no, the, in the book, yeah. uh, allow me to, to finish, George, it's an important point, because I don't think we gain anything by downplaying this. Downplaying it, uh, I think, uh, actually ended up elevating the death toll in the United States by persuading people uh, very, very misleadingly that they were more at risk from a vaccine than from the virus. And we probably lost a, around 100 to 200,000 Americans since va vaccines became abundantly available to a fundamental underestimate of the virus by people who were over the age of, let's say, 50 and not in particularly great health, which, let's mm. face it, is a big proportion of the American population because mm. obesity is a, uh, a very serious uh, problem in this country. So I think it's a mistake to say, as I think you were trying to say in the review and are saying now, oh, this is all overstated. No, this was a pandemic as bad as 57, 58, not as bad as 1918, 19, but it was a real pandemic. And it's still killing people, particularly in those parts of the world that have nowhere near uh, vaccinated their population. And in those parts of the world, it will probably kill, I'm guessing, a, at least another few hundred thousand people before we can really say we've got to the endemic phase. So I don't think there's anything to be gained by, by saying it's a nothing burger, because it just doesn't seem plausible to me that we would have had this level of excess mortality without SARS-CoV-2 and the disease that it causes. Well, I, uh, Sinatra Gupta, uh, who has uh, uh, signed the Great Barrington Declaration, which uh, I'm part of... Uh, I, I know her, and yeah. I know Jay Bhattacharya, who was just with us at, yeah. at Hoover doing Goodfellas the other day. And I, I don't disagree with the argument that there were well, far better ways of dealing with this than blanket lockdowns. And that when we do the cost-benefit analysis, I'm pretty sure we'll find that the benefits were pretty close to the same as the costs. I almost feel as if the lockdowns will turn out to have been a wash when we properly account for the costs as well oh, as the benefits. A, how, do, how, how do you make the argument the, that the lockdowns did any good whatsoever? There's no correlation, but well, I think that's, because that's I think stringency. Did you see that stringency chart? The stringency just, correlations are, which is aren't there. economists. Yeah. The, 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 this is a, an argument which is about to be terminated. I can tell. The uh, times, time is winging. No, we could have, we could have the audience. We got lots of people we, who got know more than I do about this. But the, the counterfactual of no lockdowns, the counterfactual of no lockdowns after the virus had spread pretty much uh, throughout Britain, Europe, the US, is clearly going to give you a quite a significantly higher death toll. The question is whether there was a smarter way of avoiding that than blanket lockdowns. And there I agree. Uh, with the, the Great Barrington folks, that we could have had a much, much smarter, more targeted set of restrictions. Yeah. But in truth, we missed the opportunity. The real counterfactual is why the hell were we not doing what they were doing in Taiwan and South Korea and actually testing people within weeks of the identification of the virus. That is where the real oh. failure lay, in my view. Hey, George, George, while you were quiet, then, um, I'll be shocked if there are no questions in this session. There's a microphone right over there. If you need to go to the microphone, George, go ahead. Well, the, I think what we could uh, do questions. The, uh, the essential argument of the Great Barrington people, and particularly Gupta, was that in battling a virus of this sort, locking down was exactly the wrong course. That uh, the effective way of meeting viruses throughout human history has been to educate 
our immune systems, which are uh, through exposure, uh, and that uh, the reason pandemics have become less severe, as you've documented so well over the centuries, is that our is that precisely the spread of globalization, international trade, immigration, uh, tourism, uh, all these the integration of global societies prevented the kind of extinction events that befell the uh, Native Americans in the United States with the arrival of Europeans. And, and, and uh, Gupta fears that we're plunging into a dark age for immune systems. I, I like, believe that, that may like exaggerate doom, the... That sounds like doom-mongering itself to me. Yeah, right, it is, well, uh, it's... Uh, but... But the whole idea that we can hide out from a virus, that, that wearing a mask makes any difference, that, uh, that, that somehow uh, this um, affliction, which has uh, accompanied all human history, can somehow be met by these feckless little social distancing and posturing and, and uh, lawyers. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, this is, I think this has really been a, an amazing epidemic of imbecile ideas. And, uh, and I, uh, and, and, well, obviously, the, the people in the position to applaud like that are not the people who ended up in intensive care, yeah. manifestly. And I think one has to avoid a frivolous uh, discussion of these issues. Uh, there are countries that essentially uh, hadn't the capability uh, to do anything like a lockdown. Mexico, for example, basically uh, didn't. And you have higher excess mortality in those uh, Latin American countries, which aren't in terms of public health, so very different from uh, much of the United States. So the counterfactual that we would somehow have had lower mortality without lockdowns isn't plausible to me. But there are multiple, multiple things that we did that were imbecilic, and here we don't actually disagree. And I mean, I see people still peddling around the Stanford campus on their bicycles with masks on, on their bicycles. They're more likely to have masks on than helmets. But that is the kind of... My, my favorite example of Californian madness was that in this outdoor swimming pool uh, at Stanford, there was a buffer lane for many, many months uh, last year uh, to prevent the virus swimming, which it obviously does laterally, uh, <laughs> from the kids' part of the pool to the adult uh, lap swimmers. And any number of mad regulations proliferated uh, because this was a terrific opportunity for the bureaucracy to invent new regulations, and, and they seized on it with alacrity, yeah, which yeah. was precisely why I went to Montana, because I had a sense that, uh, at least in Montana, there would be a sane kind of approach, which there was. So I don't, I don't, I don't want us to end up with caricature positions here. We could clearly have handled this far, far better than we did. Yeah. Uh, my point is simply that if you imagine a counterfactual without any restrictions on movement, when you've got a low dispersion factor, I mean, this thing is basically spread by super spreaders. 20% of the people do 80% of the spreading. If you have indoor events with poor ventilation and infected people, a lot of people will get the disease and the, and the older, frailer people will, will very likely get very sick. So there were ways we could have attacked this problem with far more precision than we did. And that's where I agree with, uh, with Gupta and Bhattacharya and, and the great Barrington folks. Let's not pretend we're we're miles apart on this, I don't think there can be any serious dispute that the United States public health bureaucracy bungled this and proved itself to be anything but the best prepared public health bureaucracy in the world for a pandemic. My concern is that there'll be not only future pandemics, but different forms of disaster. And here the real point of doom is this. If that's a problem in public health, Let's ask ourselves what other parts of our government have preparedness plans that will turn out to disintegrate on contact with a disaster. How will we do, let us 
address a technology audience if there really is a large-scale cyber attack designed to cripple the critical infrastructure of the United States. I bet you there's a 36-page cyber attack plan somewhere in the bowels of the Pentagon, but I'm not aware of anybody actually having tried to see if it would work in any simulated exercise. I don't know of any organization, certainly none that I'm involved with, that has had a drill for a cyber attack. So I think it's not that there'll be some other pandemic next year. History doesn't like to repeat itself. There'll be a different kind of disaster, and it will expose once Climate again... Climate change, right? Well, that's the favorite disaster of the, of the bureaucracy because it's the slowest moving thing. So they really like climate change because it's the slowest moving of the grey rhinos and it justifies God's plan like interventions in economic life. Look at what the Europeans are doing and what many people in this country would like to do. But in reality, as COVID taught us, the real disasters move way faster than we could imagine rising temperatures uh, moving. And we'll be caught blindsided by some other disaster because we have a fake bureaucratic culture of preparedness. And it's that fake preparedness that I think you and I would agree yeah, is uh, agree. At, at the heart of the problem in the country today. Yeah, we should give some yeah. of it. We have time for about two or three short questions. Uh, well, my name's Dave Barber. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving us uh, copies of your book. I certainly look forward to reading it, um, but I don't know what's in it yet. But I'm we're, also... we're, we're giving it to you, the cause. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So. Uh, <laughs> But I would also have to admit that George just stole my thunder. I was going to ask uh, perhaps for some comment on climate change and uh, looking at climate change uh, from the perspective of those harbingers of doom that uh, would, would say that it, it is taking on catastrophic proportions. If you have anything more to say, I mean, if you've already addressed it, that's fine. Thank you. Well, it's worth... I think paying tribute to some of the people, uh, Michael Schellenberg and uh, and Bjorn Lomberg, who, who who have written recently in insane ways on this subject, uh, and and Lomberg I think is right to point out that uh, given uh, that this there is, is Bjorn Bjorn how do you pronounce that Bjorn Lomberg uh, yeah, uh, um, is how you pronounce his his name and and in in his courageous work which has made him incredibly unpopular with the Al Gores and Greta Thunbergs. He has argued that you've got to be very careful uh, not to take action that will be so economically debilitating that you'll inflict greater costs on yourself than climate change itself will. We, we clearly are going to have to adjust. I think it would be futile to deny that there are going to be consequences to rising average temperatures, whatever you think is driving those. But Lomberg's point is that much of what is proposed good by or Europeans... Good consequences. Well, they'll be good. It depends where you live. Mm. And, I mean, it'd be great if you're can Canadian, and it's really going to suck if you're in large parts of Africa. Mm. And that's the reality. It's incredibly unfair climate change. The incidence is really, really unequal. And it will yeah. probably cause the most havoc to the dense, very large, populous cities of the coastal uh, Asian region. I mean, that seems to me like where you'll get the biggest I, trouble. I doubt it. But, <laughs> you know, the great thing about this is it's so slow moving that we'll both be dead before it's clear who's right. Well, I, I, I'm skeptical. You're young, Niall. I'm 57, <laughs> and climate change is not moving that fast. I'm skeptical in, in the way that Bjorn is. I see what the Europeans are trying to do, and it's not feasible. They are trying to shift to relying on so-called renewables, that is to say predominantly on solar and wind power, uh, to generate electricity. And it, it isn't going to work. And you can already see that it isn't going to work by the wild price swings that are happening. So I think what will happen is that this planned economy approach to a problem which may possibly be serious, we don't know, it may, this planned economy approach will be ultimately more disruptive uh, in, its, in the short run than uh, than climate change itself will we'll probably precipitate a real political backlash against these measures. People can worry about climate change, but tell them that the cost of carbon is rising, and they'll say, well, what the hell does that mean? And then they find out what it means is that the cost of fueling the vehicle and the cost of heating the house has gone up really significantly. The hits to consumption that are implied in a lot of these grand plans are really quite significant. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're politically viable. And that's, that's the way I think about this. 
the law of unintended consequences is really powerful in energy markets. And the policymakers don't really understand the physics of what they're doing. Mm. Let's take another question. Uh, I wanted to ask you really quickly about a politics of a different kind of catastrophe. It's probably not in this book, but the catastrophe of what's going on in our universities today. And I wanted you to just talk for a minute about the new university that you are part of founding, um, along with Barry Weiss and, and Jonathan Haidt and a lot of other great people, uh, I and Hersey Ali, uh, in, in uh, Austin. Can you talk about that, which is really good news? Thanks. Well, it's only just been announced this week that we're uh, trying to create a new university, University of Austin, that will be committed to the fundamental principles of, of academic freedom, of free inquiry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the reason we have to do this is that we see so many limitations on, on free uh, uh, inquiry and academic freedom in the established universities. We shouldn't have to create a new one, but I think we've reached the point at which it has to be a part of the solution. It's very difficult to do a startup in academia. I mean, I've been involved in, in different forms of startup. Normally, when you start a business, people just leave you to it, mm -hmm. and they pay attention if it's worth $1 billion one day. Uh, but if you start anything in academia, uh, the hate begins immediately, <laughs> because you have to kill it in the cradle just in case it works. So we've spent the last 48 hours dealing with a tidal wave of, of Twitter hate, uh, oh, which, as I said in a piece that I published on Monday, illustrates that we must be above the target because that's when you get the most flack. I think that we need not just one but multiple new universities, yeah. that if we do not uh, take this initiative, there is going to be a slow and steady stifling of free inquiry in our universities. Now, um, imagine the majority of people here are not directly involved in academic life. And so there's a tendency for people outside it to think back to their college days and say, what are they on about? The chilling of academic freedom in the last five or so years in the major campuses is a deeply shocking thing. There is a kind of totalitarianism light going on in our universities, where so-called uh, cancel culture has created a pervasive climate of fear. Uh, where people do not, students do not speak their minds, professors do not speak their minds. This is clear from John Haight's surveys at Heterodox Academy. It's clear for multiple surveys. I'll give you one statistic, and then I know we're short of time, but this is the one thing that really made me think I have to do something. In a survey of undergraduates across the United States uh, earlier this year, more than 80%, in fact, it was 85% of self-described liberal students said they would report a professor to the university authorities if the professor said something that they, con they considered offensive. And if it was one of their classmates, then three quarters of them said that they would report their classmates <laughs> to the university authorities. These young people don't appear to realize that they're behaving as if they were in Stalin's Soviet Union. Mm. They're, they're so poorly educated that they don't feel the kind of moral revulsion that one should feel when tempted to inform on a colleague or on a, on a professor. So we're creating a new institution. I hope you will all get in behind us and uh, push back against the haters. And I very much hope that in 20 years' time, uh, it will be uh, a beacon of free thought and a place where technology uh, can be studied and, uh, and where we can have innovation. Austin, Texas is quite good from that uh, point of view and where we'll be able to collaborate with the tech sector. Because the, the killer combination, the thing that can give this country an absolutely bright and dazzling future is the combination of that ancient wisdom that we trace back beyond the enlightenment, beyond the origins of the country, the ancient wisdom that we need to keep communicating to our young people and the wonders of science and technology. Yeah. That's what an, an education should be about. Increasingly, it's not. Thank you. That's great. We are out of time, but that's a great way to conclude this session. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. A great, it was a great event.